Today's video is sponsored by 1440. Get the news you need without all the extra BS with 1440's free app. More on them in a bit. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects and another episode about a wall, because <laughs> of the things I could have predicted content-wise on Mega Projects, I'd never be like, you know what's gonna be a big hit, Simon? Walls. Covering all of the walls. So today we are covering the Antonine Wall, the other great Roman wall. Let's jump in, shall we? In the second century AD, the land beyond the boundary of the most northerly point of the Roman Empire was an area where even the all-conquering legions had failed to subdue. It was here that the Romans, who had systematically crushed all resistance before them, finally met their match and chose to focus on the defensive rather than the offensive. A great wall was built that stretched across Great Britain, which came to be known as Hadrian's Wall. Designed to keep the tribes to the north out of the Roman Empire, it was broadly successful, but just 20 years after its completion, Roman legions again marched north, intending to build a second wall. And this is the story of that second wall. The Antonine Wall's fame pales in comparison to its more illustrious brother to the south. If Hadrian's Wall is Alec Ball, Baldwin, the Antonine Wall is Daniel Baldwin. <laughs> Who the hell's Daniel Baldwin? But I guess that's the point. Impressive in its own right, but for nearly 2,000 years, almost entirely overshadowed by what came before it. Another reason the Antonine Wall has perhaps not reached the same level of fame is that there is today very little left of this turf wall with stone foundations that stretched for 63 kilometers, that's 39 miles between the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde. This wall requires a little more imagination, but we're still quite an extraordinary feat of engineering carried out deep within the hostile territory. To add further intrigue to the tale, the wall was abandoned just eight years after its completion, with the Romans choosing instead to backtrack to Hadrian's Wall, where they held on grimly for another couple of hundred years before gradually being ejected from the British Isles. The Antonine Wall is one of the great forgotten mega projects of antiquity. It was here that the Romans drew the final northern line on their vast and sprawling empire. Firstly, we've recently done videos on Hadrian's Wall and the Roman Empire itself, so if you're in a particularly Roman mood today, well, you know what comes next. Maybe lie back, eat some grapes, and watch our Roman videos. Is that that's such a stereotype? <laughs> like the, the Roman dude eating the grapes on the like couch with the thing at the end. Anyway, the Romans first arrived on the British shores in 55 BC, the first of two invasions by Julius Caesar, the second of which came the following year. While the British were defeated and a puppet ruler installed, the Romans didn't stay. And it wasn't until 43 AD that Emperor Claudius instructed his legions to invade and bring Britain and its ragtag band of tribes under the yoke of Roman rule. The conquest of Britain was a bloody 40-year campaign, which was effectively concluded in 87 AD. Up to a quarter of a million Britons died during this period, meaning that potentially an eighth of Britain's two million inhabitants became victims of Roman expansion. But even for the legendary legions, there were limits, and that limit was Caledonia. The name Caledonia was used to describe the land north of the River Forth in what is present-day Scotland. Now, if you've ever trekked into the Scottish Highlands on a grey mist day, I have, then you might understand why the Romans threw their hands up in desperation and announced Satis, which is Latin for enough. Satis Caledonia, Satis! As the English were to discover well over a thousand years later, conquering Caledonia and its people is no easy task. The fact that Caledonia remained out of Rome's sphere of influence was certainly not from want of trying. On numerous occasions, Romans' legions marched north with varying degrees of success. In 84 AD, at the Battle of Mons Graupius, an army of some 30,000 Caledonians faced 20,000 well-trained Roman legionaries. The result was little more than a bloodbath, with a third of the Caledonians being killed to just 360 on the Roman side. The legionaries are really good at fighting. But while the battle had been an absolute disaster for the Caledonians, two-thirds managed to escape and disappear quietly into the islands. Over the next 40 years or so, the pendulum swung back and forth as the Romans struggled to stamp their authority on the tribes of the far north. Now, it is worth remembering that we're talking about a period nearly 2,000 years ago, and sometimes the facts become just a little bit vague, and sometimes you're like, 
Is that a legend or did it actually happen? Well, we're never really sure, and the next story is one such example. One potential act that led to increased fortifications in the north of Britain was the disappearance of the Roman Ninth Legion. This was an experienced group of 5,000 of the finest legionaries around whose fate has long been argued over. What we are sure of is that all traces of the Ninth seem to end around 120 AD. The most well-told tale, which doesn't always necessarily make it true, tells of the Ninth Legion marching north into Caledonia, never to be heard from again. Others claim that the Ninth was redeployed to the Middle East and met their fate there, while yet another theory states that they were sent into modern-day Holland. But frustratingly, there is practically no evidence to back up any of these theories. However, we are fairly certain that during the rule of Emperor Hadrian, the Romans suffered huge losses in Britain, which led to a troop surge and the building of the largest wall that the Roman Empire ever constructed. Look, as mentioned, we already have a video on this particular wall, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it right here. Construction began on Hadrian's Wall in 122 AD and took six years to complete. It was 117.5 kilometers, that's 73 miles long, and linked Wall's Ends in the east to Bowness on Solway in the west. While the wall's primary role was to certainly act as a border barrier, it most likely was also used to regulate those coming and going, and no doubt collected customs fees from those wishing to buy or sell within the Roman Empire. Hadrian's Wall was finished in 128 AD, and at first appeared to act as the final marker of the Roman Empire to the north. We have to speculate here, as we have no concrete information of what went on between the completion of Hadrian's Wall and the start of the Antonine Wall, a period of less than 20 years. What is certain is that Emperor Hadrian was successful succeeded by Emperor Antonius, and we can probably assume that things were far from quiet on the northern front. Another theory is that the new emperor wanted to simply boost his political standing back in Rome, and the nagging issue of Britain perhaps gave him exactly the kind of excuse that he needed to order his troops north. The remains of the Antonine Wall are far less impressive than those that lie roughly 160 kilometers, that's 100 miles to the south. While stretches of stone can still be seen that once formed Hadrian's Wall, very little remains of the Antonine Wall bar ditches, mounds, and the odd foundation. So impressive stuff. You got a trip. Hey, wow, we're going to visit the Antonine Wall. That is a ditch. <laughs> The man tasked with building the Antonine Wall was Roman general Quintus Lollius Urbicus. <laughs> Something brilliant about Roman names, isn't there? <laughs> Lollius. The location between the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde was almost certainly chosen because it was the shortest distance between the North Sea and the Irish Sea, and would probably have cut through pre-existing tribal boundaries, presumably with scant regard for those it now divided. Lazy Romans choosing the shortest distance. Lazy. Now, speaking of being divided, how about a word from today's video sponsor, 1440? They want to cut through the BS and totally revolutionize the way that you get the news. Chances are you fall into one of three categories. You might get your news from social media, or perhaps spend way too much time watching sensationalized cable news, or maybe you just don't pay attention to it at all. It's hard to figure out which one of those is worse. These days, it's harder than ever to find a news source that will just tell you the facts and leave their opinions out. Out of it. Fortunately, this 1440, which wants to be your all-in-one source of impartial, quickly digestible news, it's easy to sign up for, also totally free. If you keep a busy schedule like me, it can be hard to find the time to dedicate to current events. But with 1440's easy news blurbs, you can quickly get the info you need in just a few minutes, over breakfast or maybe while you're commuting to work, assuming you don't drive. If you're really in a rush, just stick to the primary news section. If you've got a bit more time, why not wade into secondary categories? like sport, business, science, and more. Best of all, it is just the news. All filler, no killer, no clickbait, no spin. They give you the facts and then they allow you to form your own opinion. It sounds ridiculous, but it's actually a novel idea in today's news world. So get informed without all the BS today. Click the link in the description below or go to join1440.com forward slash megaprojects and subscribe to 1440 for free today. Again, join1440.com forward slash megaprojects and let's get back to the video. An estimated 7,000 men, lazy men, <laughs> worked on the, they weren't lazy, they built this giant wall, worked on the Antonine Wall for eight years. Like Hadrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall was built by the Roman legion stationed in the area at the time, and the group probably consisted of three separate legions. When you think of Roman legions, you probably think of lazy. <laughs> 
not really. When you think of Roman legions, you probably think of clinical, deadly warriors and their famous tortoise formation that was often used to approach enemy structures. But a Roman legion was far more than just expert swordsmen. It typically traveled with its own surveyors, engineers, masons, joiners, and laborers who were rather adept at throwing together bridges or roads at short notice. These men would have camped in leather tents or temporary huts within small compounds constructed along the route. Considering that this construction project was deep inside enemy territory, it's kind of impossible to believe that the legions not only built the wall, but also constantly defended themselves while building it. The Antonine Wall was far less imposing than its bigger brother to the south and was formed of a bank of turf almost three meters, that's about 10 feet high, and four meters, 13 feet wide. This was built over stone foundations about the same width, and this would have helped with drainage and stability. Around 20 separate layers of turf were then added on top of one another that would have brought up the wall to its full height. Along the top of this turf mound was a wooden palisade that acted as a walkway and would have had further fencing on the northern side. Now, it's worth noting that the makeup of the wall changed along its route with eastern sections using just clay and earth rather than turf, probably down to just a lack of its availability in the area. To the north of the wall ran a ditch, which in places reached as deep as 5 meters, that's 16 and a half feet, and to the south was a road known as the Military Way that ran parallel to the wall along its entire route. This was used as a service road that would have enabled legions to move quickly and support different points of the Antonine Wall. Now, this wall was marked by distance slabs, which either gave distances, as you might have expected, but also with a ceremonial role. 20 of these slabs still actually survive to today, the most famous being the Bridgeness Slab, which was created to mark the completion of the wall and includes the passage. For the Emperor Caesar, Titus, Aelius, Hadrianus, Antonius, Augustus, Pius, father of his country, the second Augustan legion completed the wall over a distance of 4,652 paces. This slab also includes the depiction of Britons being trampled and killed by Roman cavalrymen, just in case there was any doubt over the Roman mandate in the region at the time. <laughs> what are we here to do? Kill, boys! <laughs> Interestingly, tests done on the slab are found small traces of pigment, particularly red, which suggests it was once brightly colored with heathen's blood. Not really, it was just brightly colored. Originally, the Romans had planned to build a fort every 10 kilometers, that's every 6 miles, but this quickly changed to every 3.3 kilometers or 2 miles, probably due to the threat of tribal attacks. All of these forts were constructed using local sandstone where available, and would have the typical red tiles on the roof, which were common in the Roman Empire at the time. Very little remains of these forts today, with the rough castle fort 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles southeast of Bonnie Bridge, the best preserved one. This was the second smallest of the forts and had an area of roughly 4,000 square meters, or about 43,000 square feet. That's just less than half of a typical city block in Manhattan. The foundations of the commander's house, the barracks, the headquarters, the bathhouse, and granary, all discovered during excavation work done during the first half of the 20th century. From artifacts found at the time, we know that Rough Castle Fort once housed 480 men of the Cohors 6 Nevorium of Neri, an auxiliary unit drawn from Gaul that's modern France. Excavations around this fort also revealed yet another form of defense that the Romans implemented to try and fortify this wild part of northern Britain. To the northwest, archaeologists found a series of pits known as Ilias, which would have housed sharpened stakes at the bottom. These Ilias were often located close to vulnerable sections of the wall, perhaps near to gateways, and would have been carefully camouflaged. Had there been a sneak attack while the gateway was open, countless would have fallen into these deadly pits where they had absolutely nothing to look forward to but a slow and agonizing death, or until a Roman legionary came along and put them out of their misery. Brilliant either way. If the Antonine Wall was supposed to cement Rome's power in the north, it actually did the opposite. Again, we need to speculate a little bit here, but most likely the new turf wall came under a withering attack from the Caledonians. We know that the Romans eventually and voluntarily retreated to Hadrian's Wall around 160 AD, and to push the might of Rome back, it must have been quite an onslaught. I've used the word voluntarily there, but it may well have gotten to the point that they simply had no choice, and there are the dales of the Antonine Wall being overrun, but 
it's far from clear. Emperor Antonius' plan of pacifying the North had backfired spectacularly, and his successor, Marcus Aurelius, almost immediately reverted to using Hadrian's Wall as the northern extremity of the empire. Over time, it became clear that perhaps the entire wall construction and surgence of the North was little more than an attempt at securing a military triumph to boost Antonius' reputation back in Rome. It certainly wouldn't have been the first time a Roman emperor chose personal triumph over pragmatism, but in this case, he gained little from the construction of the Antonine Wall. Now, if you think that the Caledonians in this area lived happily ever after after this point, then think again. Countless more incursions north took place as the Romans time and time again attempted to break the will of those who simply refused to bow to Rome. But again and again, the Romans retreated. By the 3rd century, Rome's power was waning and raiding parties now poured south past Hadrian's Wall to take advantage of an empire in its final death throes. Rome retaliated, but the end was nigh. In 383 AD, Roman legions began leaving Britain, and by 410 AD, Rome's rule over Britain had all but ended. By that point, the area around the Antonine Wall had long been free of the tyranny of the Latin would-be rulers, and the wall itself had already begun to decay. The memory of the stubborn attempts of Rome to suppress the people of Caledonia was quickly fading, and over time, this impressive turf wall quietly withered away, leaving only mounds and ditches where the great Roman frontier once stood. So I really hope you found that video about a wall interesting. It's maybe the third or fourth wall we've covered here on Mega Projects. If you've got more wall suggestions, let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.